Every American citizen must have an equal right to vote. There is no moral issue. We're the United States of America. One man, one vote. If that's our definition of democracy, and then we don't give the one man the vote, big fat lie. What happens in North Carolina is going to be very important for what happens in the whole country. This is the test ground for voter rights. The NAACP claims a state board of elections and three county boards are removing thousands of people from voter rolls illegally. People volunteer in a lot of ways. I work for everyone to be able to vote. Well, I've been clicking back and forth, website to website, trying to figure out where I could be most useful. I feel a little bit like I'm stepping off a cliff. People on the ground are already reporting suppression of the vote. Our legislature decided to pass some voter restrictions that significantly altered voting in North Carolina. We knew it was being challenged in court. So how do we even prepare for election day not knowing what laws are gonna be in effect? I wish I knew this law as well as I know my everyday working law, and it's important because I only get one chance to get it right. I'm hoping that we will merely be observing people carrying out their democratic rights in a peaceful way. I am a lawyer, and I've been assigned to answer questions. This woman was just telling us she got in right at the beginning, and they kept her in there for 45 minutes, said it was a complete mess. Excuse me, ma'am, did everything go okay? Were you able to vote? They sent me from the one on Cliffdale over here, and now I got to go over there. Me and two other black guys are the only guys that the DMV got to process. They sent me here. Now these people here tell me I cannot vote here. It's not here. No, no. This is not here fair. Help. Nobody would fight this hard to take something from us that wasn't powerful. When you deny a person the right to vote, then you take away every other constitutional right that they might have. People are aware that there's a problem. I don't believe people are aware of the extent of the problem. The history of our country is a history of struggle for the right to have a voice. Each one of us has some valuable asset that we can use to fight these fights that need to be fought now. We better use what's in our hands. The heart and soul of America is at stake. Good morning, everyone. Wonderful to see you here. My name is David Birdsell. I'm Dean of the Austin W. Marks School of Public and International Affairs, and very pleased to welcome you to this first Marks Issues Forum of this academic year. Uh, we're here today to talk about an issue that is, of course, central to our democracy, and that is access to the ballot, the right to vote. Uh, it's guaranteed in the Constitution, but it can be complicated in any number of ways, which we'll find out about over the course of the next 75 minutes or so. Uh, let me just say a couple of things in preface. First, you just saw a trailer for the film Capturing the Flag, uh, which focuses on ballot access issues in the state of North Carolina. I'm very pleased to say that uh, the director and producer, as well as one of the producers of the program, are here today, uh, Anne DeMare and Elizabeth Hammerdinger. Uh, so please wave and take a bow. Um, and the other producer is Laverne Berry, who was the first person that you saw interviewed uh, in, the, in the trailer that we just saw. Um, this film can be seen in the places that you see behind me. Uh, please take an opportunity to look at the entire thing, and it really gives you a wonderful chance that we don't have the time to do in full uh, force today to take a look on the ground at the way that some of these things are playing out in a state that may, of course, be pivotal, uh, not only to the composition of the Senate, but, of course, to the, uh, to, to the presidency in 2020. Um, 
Now, what we're going to do today is to hear from four distinguished panelists who have been paying a great deal of attention to this issue uh, for a long time. We'll have a conversation here on the dais, and after that conversation uh, is wrapping up, we'll move to you. Uh, because I know that you have lots and lots of questions, and this is a marvelous opportunity uh, to talk to the experts about uh, what they know and what they'll do. Let me briefly introduce the panelists that we have with us here this morning. Uh, Ezra Rosenberg, on my far right, is co-director of the Voting Rights Project, overseeing all voting rights litigation at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law, where he handles cases involving voter purges, suppressive voter ID, census citizenship questions, as well as racial and partisan gerrymandering. Uh, and if any of those terms seem unfamiliar, I think they will probably be made familiar very rapidly. Um, Melissa Mark Viverito, on my left, uh, is senior advisor to the Latino Victory Fund, a political action organization working to enhance Latino political power by fostering representation at every level of government. Previously, she served as speaker of the New York City Council, becoming the first Puerto Rican and Latina to hold citywide office. And most critically, she is a distinguished alumna of the Mark School of Public and International Affairs. Huzzah, brava. Um, and on my right, Susan Lerner has been executive director of Common Cause New York for over a decade. She writes and speaks extensively on voting rights, election reform, campaign finance, redistricting, ethics, transparency, and more, uh, and is a go-to source for reporters and editorial board writers. Uh, most relevantly, Susan currently leads Let New York Vote, a statewide coalition of grassroots groups, advocacy organizations, and unions working together to modify the state's voting laws. Um, and then finally, on my far left, just in terms of where we are in the dais, uh, is <laughs> Professor Douglas Musio uh, of the Mark School of Public and International Affairs, my longtime colleague specializing in American public opinion, voting behavior, and city politics. Professor Musio has extensive political, governmental, and media experience. He is founder and currently chief pollster at the Baruch College Survey Research, joined by his colleague Mickey Blum in the front row. Uh, Please, a hand for these wonderful people and what they'll be talking about today. Uh, let me ask Ezra to start us off. Uh, Ezra, you have been working on the front lines, uh, both in terms of your own litigation practice and a team of lawyers who have been addressing these issues. Uh, what do you see as the most critical issues as we approach just uh, a, a little bit more than uh, four weeks out the election that we come to on November 6th? Uh, thank you, Dean, and that's a great question. It's, it, it's actually like whack-a-mole because there, there are really hundreds of issues. If you, if you stop a poll consolidation as we did in uh, Randolph County, Georgia two weeks ago, there's a, some, some other poll con consolidation in, in another district. Uh, or there's a voter purge as we saw again in New York just two weeks ago after we, with Susan's help, helped, we thought, stop the problem of voter purges in, in New York. Uh, so there's any number, and then everything is really made worse by the direction the courts are going. So if I were to say what's the number one problem we have right now, <laughs> it's the direction the courts are going, because the federal courts do not promise to be our friends in the fight that we're going to have to have from, from this day forward. Let me follow up with just one question specifically to courts. Uh, in 2013, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was uh, struck down. Can you say a little bit about why that's important sure. uh, and how that affects the work that you do in the field today? Yeah, for, for those who, who don't know, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act it required certain jurisdictions, those that had a history of discrimination, racial and ethnic discrimination, to get the approval of either the Attorney General or a three-judge court in the District of Columbia before they could implement any change in voting rights. And that meant if you, before you implement a, a voter ID law, before you change election districts, you had to get approval. That was a pretty big thing. What happened in 2013 is that the United States Supreme Court said that this law was outdated. It was outdated only five years after a unanimous Senate had reenacted it, which makes absolutely no sense unless you really want to kill a beneficial law. Without those protections, we no longer have notice before a change in voting rights is implemented in states that have a history of discrimination. Uh, and for example, the day that the uh, Supreme Court issued its decision, which was I think June 25th of 2013, 
North Carolina passed the statute that you saw in, in, in this wonderful trailer for, for what looks to be a great documentary, uh, which was an omnibus, uh, awful bill that had a whole bunch of bad things that has ultimately been reversed. And Texas mm -hmm. implemented a law that we had already gotten kicked out under Section 5. Yep. So it's an awful situation. And as advocates, we relied on Section 5 notice. <clears throat> or, uh, frankly, to stop things that we were unable to prevent in the advocacy. So if the Board of Elections adopted a policy that we thought was really not worthwhile and really discriminatory, we didn't have to race into court in advance. We knew that the, there was a good chance that the Department of Justice would stop it and that we would have an opportunity to comment to the Department of Justice and say, we're unable to get the board to adopt the policy that we think that makes the most sense in your Section 5 clearance. Please pay attention to the following facts. Susan, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, your experiences here in New York. Of course, New York was not subject to Section 5. It was not one of the... This is why we yes, do these things. Right. We want Melissa is definitely yes. going to take yes. your head off on yes. that one. Um, Not no. For the first time. In the first <laughs> renewal to the Voting Rights Act, Section 5 was expanded to deal with language discrimination. And we have a terrible history here in New York City of discriminating against Spanish speakers who are American, natural born American citizens, the Puerto Rican community. So New York City, in a major part, is subject, was subject to free clearance. <laughs> which was a great boon for us with our retrogressive uh, Board of Elections. So here, what's most challenging, and I was at a screening at NYU um, last week mm -hmm. uh, where uh, the uh, capture of the flag, capturing the flag was shown to a very enthusiastic house. And Reverend Barber was speaking, and I was preparing myself to get up and grab the microphone, and he beat me to it. He said, you know, all of these things that we are fighting to preserve in North Carolina, you don't even have in New York. So for those of us who think of New York as a progressive state, and I have literally had people say to me, I don't have to worry about New York. I want to go down to North Carolina. I'm concerned about Pennsylvania, et cetera, et cetera. When we start to talk about what we actually have here in terms of our laws, our laws were written primarily in the 1890s and mm. not significantly improved since. So we are running our elections in the largest jurisdiction. I agree with that angry sound. <laughs> with, that, with the largest jurisdiction in the country, election jurisdiction in the country, as if we were still in 1890. We have deadlines that were set for back when you had to hand carry paper from place to place, and where you had to hand write out the information. Um, we have a political, patronage style of, of administering our elections, because in 1890, the most creative way they could think of to have honest elections was to have a Democrat and a Republican pitted against each other. Well, we, we unfortunately know that that is actually not a way to get integrity. And either they polarize and they split and nothing happens, or worst of all, they collude against the voters because they have their incumbents to protect. So we are way far behind. And as a consequence, we have among the lowest voter turnout in the country. Because people, voters get the message if they are regarded as irrelevant by their state law. I find it amazing, having done good government work in other states, that when you're talking about voters in New York State, you're talking about Democrats, you're talking about Republicans, but the largest growing group of voters in our state is referred to by election administrators as blanks. <laughs> now, what does that tell you? They have no role, but they are the second largest registration group. Mm -hmm. People who don't want to be affiliated with either party, but the parties are deeply entwined in our election system, and frankly, they have a stranglehold on it and an investment in keeping us from having 21st century elections. We at Let New York Vote are dedicated to changing that, and I am very hopeful that in the 2019 session, we are going to see some common sense solutions like early voting, yes. automatic voter registration, <laughs> consolidating our primaries. We're all paying an extra $25 million, thank you, because our legislature cannot get the date 
of the congressional primary and the date of the state primary together, only state. So New York is exceptional. For its elections, it's exceptionally behind. <clears throat> yep. And I want to return to this issue of just the administration of elections absent any potential animus toward one group or another. Right. But let's, let's get back to that later. I, I want to go to you, Melissa, and ask about uh, the impact of voter registration uh, processes, efforts to try to deny access to the ballot, particularly to Latino populations. Uh, in New York, certainly, but I'm really thinking about the broader national impact right uh, now. So, so part of, uh, uh, so I'm uh, affiliated and I work at Latino Victory Fund, which basically is a progressive, we, call, we say is a progressive political movement. We uh, endorse uh, Latino candidates only, uh, up and down the ballot, but obviously we have a real focus right now on the congressional rate uh, midterm elections. And what we notice historically is that uh, when you have Latinos on the ballot, that helps kind of mobilize and encourage the Latino community to come out and, and, and vote in greater numbers. Now, you know, when we talk about uh, all these tactics uh, and threats to, to the vote, what is the ultimate end goal here, right? We are becoming a much more demographically diverse country, and the issue of racial anxiety is very real. So the issue of voter suppression is a, something, is a tactic that uh, those who have power right now and don't want to relinquish it are implementing in a very aggressive way. So the idea is to suppress the vote, to discourage people to go to the ballot box, uh, to hope, you know, to clamp down on the African American vote, on the Latino vote. So when you have these experiences, what that, 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 that does eventually is discourage you maybe the next time from thinking about going to vote and therefore really trying to control the outcome. So what we're doing obviously is our interest is to agitate and to be much more aggressive in, in not having people be dissuaded from going to the ballot box. I think because at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you are counteracting uh, at the end of the day what, what the attempt is here, right? So we are seeing in this election cycle right now uh, the Latino turnout really surge. And there's unfortunately this narrative out there that it's the Latino vote is not engaged um, or that the Puerto Rican vote in particular, where there's a lot of talk about the Puerto Rican vote in Florida and in other areas where you've seen a large migration because of the fiscal crisis or because of obviously Hurricane Maria, mm -hmm. um, that there, you know, there's this narrative that they're not registering and coming out in, in election cycles. And we're just seeing that not, not play out in the reality on the ground. In Central Florida alone, over 75,000 Latinos, majority of those Puerto Rican have been registered to vote through some of the coalition work that we've been doing, some of the groups that we're affiliated with. We saw a record number of Latinos coming out in California in the midterm elections, uh, we're seeing the same happening in Pennsylvania, which is another important swing state. So we're just seeing this narrative that is not you know, real to what the, the, the reality on the ground is not with the narrative that the media is portraying. But I mean, we want to make sure that, yes, we have some great partners that are doing the work on really going to, the, to, to the, the courts and trying to push back on these measures that some of the states are implementing. You know, with the work of grassroots activists like us that are engaging and trying to get people registered is to make sure that we tell them, look, at the end of the day, the interest here is, right, for you not to vote. So let's make sure that we energize that base and, and do what you need to do. And then now we're seeing kind of like the result of that. Um, the last thing I'll just say, because, you know, uh, it, was, it was mentioned, you know, New York State really is, we're pathetic and, <laughs> and in, so many, in so many ways. And that, that, so that uh, conversation that you always hear about New York State is such a progressive state. No, and, and particularly on the voting laws. And it may not be a sexy issue, right? But we see the importance of it playing out in other states. We have to you know, bring that home as well uh, in that we don't have same day voter registration. We don't have early voting. We don't have some of these other measures that exist in other states, which would, could help drive a larger turnout. Um, it was amazing to see that in this primary in New York, we saw double the numbers of people going to the vote to the to the polls than in 2014. Mm -hmm. I mean, double. That's incredible, and that also was consistent, you know, within the commu Latino community, for instance, and other communities that that vote was was parallel. So um, it's an interesting time, and it, it, this is not going to change. Gerrymandering is another way, right, of of trying to ensure that you control the vote and the outcome. Uh, which is something else that has to be pushed back against, and New York State is also not good on that on that issue. I'm a direct result of some serious gerrymandering that happened in New York City Council, um, where my district was changed by almost 50%. Was yeah. was a new district, 
uh, that was given to me. Uh, so, you know, so, so there's a lot of work we have yet yeah. to do here in the state. But. Before I turn to Doug, I'd like you to uh, reflect a little bit on uh, something, on the confluence of uh, documentation status and, and, and ballot access. And I'm thinking, for example, of the uh, widespread threats in Texas that it's not unique to Texas, but uh, we're going to be checking I IDs. Well. Right. Exactly, we're going to be coming after people who are not registered, denying people who have been born in the United States mm -hmm. uh, the ability to register because they were delivered by midwives, uh, and then the ramifications that some expect that that might have in terms of Latino voting overall. Well, I mean, again, it's it's yes, that's a very real threat, and we we definitely have to push back. But in Texas, we've seen, particularly in the El Paso area, which is where Beto O'Rourke is from. Uh, but it's obviously heavily Latino, it, we have seen an incredible upsurge in the number of people that are registering to vote, right? So uh, we've seen a 4% surge in the El Paso County area. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are these measures that are, that are being implemented, but again, that's why it's important for people to realize that there's an attempt to strip rights that you naturally have, and so all the more reason we need to be aggressive in one, demanding that we have the ability to register, but also ensuring uh, that people are taking the time to, reg to go to vote when the time comes. So uh, we hear how this the occupant of the White House likes to try to, you know, the alternate facts and the lies that he puts out there and making it seem that voter fraud is such a pervasive problem in this country as a way of attacking black and brown people in particular, and particularly Latinos when you're talking about status, uh, that's something that's uh, more of an issue in our community. So making it seem that there's this aggressive wave of Latinos uh, that are undocumented, that are attempting to, to, you know, to vote and, and exercise a right that they have no access to. And there's a real set of individuals that believe that, right? And that start painting us all in that one image um, and, and view. And so there's a lot of, of work that we need to do. And there's a real threat to our democracy right now, this administration. Uh, uh, Trump is a real threat to our democracy, and the issue of the courts is, is the way that they are uh, really you know, lining it, it up against us. Uh, and they've been very aggressive about putting more judges that are conservative, and that will uphold these laws that are seeking to strip us of our rights. You know, so Dean, if, 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 can yeah. I just add yeah. on to that? Because I, I happen to, unfortunately, have tried the Texas photo ID case twice. Ooh. and. Um, you know, when I used to explain to my friends why well, I'm, I'm, we're attacking a photo ID law, uh, some of them would say, well, what's wrong with an ID law? You need an ID to get into some of these buildings, to courts, onto airplanes. And what people don't understand is that the sort of ID laws that we're talking about are ID laws that make it two to three times more difficult for black and Latino voters to vote, and two to three times more difficult for them to get the IDs because they don't have driver's licenses at the same rate as whites do. And the place to get these licenses are, is, sort of requires travel, which they can't do. They're very often they're on hourly jobs, so they can't take off from work. They have child rearing responsibilities. It's really, really difficult. And the only reason this is being done is to stifle the vote, yeah. because there's this myth of voter fraud. In the 10 years leading up to the enactment of the Texas photo ID law, during which time they had a, a very well working ID law. It was, not, it was not as restrictive. In those 10 years, there were 20 million ballots cast in elections in Texas, and there were only two instances of the sort of in-person voter I fraud, because in-person voter fraud is the only sort of thing a, a voter ID law can stop, someone coming in and pretending that there's someone else. And there was one guy who came in and voted and said he was his father who had recently died and they had the same name. And another genius walked into a polling place, voted, came back later in the afternoon and said he was his brother who happened to be incarcerated at the time. That was it. Two out of 20 million votes. You had two to three times a greater chance of being hit by lightning than of committing voter fraud in Texas. And we, you know, we like to think that these repressions were invented in the Deep South, that's where we're most familiar with them. No. All of the tools that were used in the Jim Crow laws and that are coming back now were invented primarily in the North to deal with immigrants, those yep. dirty Germans yep. who refused Irish. to speak English. The literacy tests that were given on Yom Kippur to keep yep. Yiddish-speaking socialists from being able to vote. We have a very checkered history, and we ought to just own it 
and solve it. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly that historical point that I wanted to turn to Doug and bring him in on this. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, this is not, as Susan is just uh, suggesting, the first time in history that we have tried to suppress a vote. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And I also wonder if you could help distinguish between registration on the one hand and then actually voting, because many more people are registered than actually turn out in November historically. Okay, I, I, I just want to start by saying that there is no federal constitutional right to vote. Just, uh, Justice Roberts, quoting two centuries of jurisprudence, in Bush said, the individual has no federal constitutional right for the electors for president of the United States. So that means that you have the devolving, the delegation of voting rights to the, the states, states, and you have you know, these myriad uh, systems, logical, illogical, but they all have vested interests behind them. And that's a problem. So you really have to look at the, the two levels, the state level and the national level, and then figure out what tactics and strategies are appropriate for each. And also, I guess the decisional calculus involves uh, how much bang you get and what are the odds of getting that bang. So you have to do a complex calculus. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, a, a campaign organizer, so, you know, limited resources. So the first thing you have to do is you have to stop the bad guys. So you have to stop the purging at the polls, convoluted registration procedures, disenfranchised felons, voter ID laws, all, all of the negative stuff. And I guess you do that through the courts and, you know, being a uh, product of the 60s, you know, little mass demonstrations don't hurt. Um, and then you have the positive uh, uh, things that can be done. And, and, and all of you were involved in it, early voting, election day registration, simplification of registration, moving election day, having it on the weekends. Uh, immigrant voting, which is uh, 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 in New York a particularly salient topic. And now I think the, the biggest uh, voting rights issue is Florida's question for giving yes. 1.5 right. million felons the right to vote. Uh, this could have profound mm -hmm. consequences uh, for the system. And Florida's online system for registration went down last night. Yes. And yes. today's the, no, deadline. Today's yes. the deadline. Yeah, yes. we're, well, we were able to, we wrote a letter yesterday to Florida. We got to at least it. a one day extension, yeah. okay. but only as to paper ballots so far, and we're working on online voting right, right now. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> please go ahead. And then there's two federal uh, issues. One is the, uh, the Voting Rights Act, you know, where the court struck down Section 4, which, was the, which is the operative section of the, of the uh, uh, case. And the Wisconsin case, Whitford versus Skill, is very interesting because it was a nine-nothing decision that, that, that said that the, the people, the litigants didn't have standing, but they remanded it to the lower court by a seven to two vote. So there's hope for some kind of give in the jurisprudence surrounding that. And Rucho, that, 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 the Rucho case, which is Common Cause right. versus Rucho in North Carolina, the plaintiffs are, we have plaintiffs from every single congressional district, individual Good. plaintiffs, we, because we anticipated the Whitford problem. Yeah, because we're, so people, we're talking about partisan gerrymandering. Right, yeah. right, uh, right. And I think that that's a, you know, an abs absolute reform uh, effort that, that has to take place. I mean, it, it takes place at the state level because of the district and commissions. Move it away from the polls. Exactly. Uh, move it to some kind of system. The New Jersey isn't perfect, but it's a, it's a better example. You have to have nonpartisan academics do it. <laughs> I, the, the, the line drawings, really? Yes. Uh, I, I want the record to show that we have a case. Somebody just said New Jersey, a better example. Um, uh, passing over that. Uh, at, 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 the, at, at the risk of oversimplification, let me suggest we have two very big baskets here, maybe three. Uh, one is how we construct the electoral system well in advance of any election, right? right. Uh, sort of uh, you know, things like uh, registering or allowing the registration of, uh, of, of 
for, uh, of ex-felons, uh, things like uh, cre creating certain forms of ballot access, motor voter, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have the things that under existing regulation get done by election officials. Uh, yeah. and, and we're really, I mean, we're, yeah. we're there right now for 2018's election, right? I mean, yeah. we're not gonna change any processes in a big way uh, between now and November 6th. So I wonder, and returning, Susan, to your point about the administration mm -hmm. of elections in New York, and Ezra, I'd also be interested uh, in, in what you're seeing people are trying to do under existing, uh, 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 existing statute right now. Um, what can be done between now and November 6th to best guarantee the access of as many people under current law legally able to vote as possible? So we have a sheet that we put out at let New York vote, which is basically protect your own vote. We are part of the mm -hmm. Election Protection Network, which the Lawyers Committee uh, has been uh, spearheading for over a decade now. But in New York, you really need to know what your rights are yourself. Um, although we relentlessly push out the 1866 Our Vote hotline, although we have people on the ground for presidential elections, we still find the people are very confused. The rules are very confusing. And the first thing that we tell people is understand what your rights are as a voter. Do not leave without casting mm -hmm. a vote. Mm -hmm. The poll worker may tell mm -hmm. you, you're not in the book, you're not entitled mm -hmm. to vote, dig your heels in. Make them look through the, vote, uh, through the voter rolls again. Check your registration online. Figure out why you're not in the book. Make sure you are in the right place. Go to the right election uh, district and have them check the book for you. And if all else fails, do not leave without casting an affidavit ballot. It, if you are correct that you are registered and there's been a mistake, then your ballot will count. But even if your ballot doesn't count, the affidavit ballot itself is a registration S form. Say a little bit more about what an affidavit ballot is. So federal law requires okay. that every voter is entitled to cast a provisional ballot, which means a ballot which may or may not count. Of course, we're exceptional in New York, so we don't call it what everybody else calls it. We call it an affidavit ballot. And the reason for that is that you fill out a ballot and then you are given an envelope where you swear under penalty of perjury, to the best of your knowledge, you are entitled to vote. But with the one reform we have been able to get in the last decade, in 2010 we got the legislature to pass a statute which says that the envelope for the affidavit ballot, in addition to having the affirmation that you are, believe you're entitled to vote, it has space for all of the information you need to be registered going forward. Previously, what would happen is you cast an affidavit ballot, they'd decide you weren't entitled to vote, and they'd write you and say, your vote wasn't counted, and by the way, come in and register. So now we streamlined that process. So the affidavit ballot is what's known as a provisional ballot in other states. And I've had social media wars with people where we put out, be sure to cast your affidavit ballot, and people have gotten back to us and said, it's never counted here in Texas, here in Indiana, or whatever. And we've had to say, it's different in New York. They will check it. We can't promise it'll be cast, but we can promise you that if there is a mess up with your registration, you will have cured it by casting an affidavit ballot. I and had to cast such a ballot back in 1993. The other, I, mean, so the I mean, look, the, the, the laws being so convoluted serve a purpose too, right? Yeah. So for instance, you know, here in New York State, the issue of those that have been incarcerated. Yes. Right, when I've, when I've done voter reg in the past, when you come across someone who has been incarcerated, they're like, I can't vote because I was incarcerated. It's like, you know, in the state of New York, if you've been in jail, but if you finish your parole and your probation, right, for the most part, uh, you can register. Right, but now we've got the executive order. Right, which, is, which has not been implemented. But, but up to this point, right, so there was always that confusion where people don't know their rights. And right. there's no yeah. attempt by the system to, to, tell to educate you. people, yeah, right, right, that once they walk out, what their rights are. But then now this executive order, how... So the executive order is really interesting. It was issued in, in the spring. And it, by Cuomo. Right? By, by Governor Cuomo, uh, following the lead of then Governor McAuliffe in Virginia. Uh, and what it does is it, the governor is granting conditional voting pardons to people who are on parole. Um, the first grouping was about 24,000 people who were already on parole. On a monthly basis, the governor gets a statement from DOCS, the 
identifies all of the people who have been released to parole, at which point the governor then issues a conditional pardon. And when that individual goes to their first visit with their parole officer, the parole officer, on top of everything else that they are telling the newly released individual, they're giving them their certificate of conditional voting pardon and a voter registration form. And at that point, once you've got that certificate, you can register like anybody else. You also can go to the DOCS, the Department of Corrections website, and look up your status to see if you have received a conditional pardon, because if you are out on parole for a while, you're not making as frequent visits to your parole officer, and you may or may not have gotten your certificate in the mail. Um, when isn't that supposed to go into effect? It's in effect. It okay. started, the first set of conditional pardons went out in August. Okay. And we have people we're working with in the, re, in the reentry community who are standing outside of parole offices and helping people fill out the forms and explaining why it's important for that community in particular to vote. We want them welcomed back yes. into our community. Yes. We want them to have an investment in being a full citizen. And frankly, our elected representatives need to hear from people who have been caught up in our so-called justice system. I mean, look, and also the reality is who's incarcerated, yes. right? When we have these over-aggressive policies that have been put in place over decades, particularly to uh, be extremely punitive to people of color, it's to strip them of certain rights as well, right? So, so that that's uh, that was the that, that's been historically what's happened. That's in Florida sure. when you were talking about that sure. ballot initiative. Sure. Florida, Florida anybody worse. that was that's incarcerated was like you. Did, you obviously life. was well, you stripped and, for life and, your voting and, right. And it extends to pretrial detainees in some places oh, wow. that's who crazy. cannot mm. vote by absentee ballot, even though ostensibly they're supposed to be able to What's vote. What jurisdiction is uh, Florida, Florida? Mississippi, Connecticut. Oh, that's crazy. Connecticut? Oh, Connecticut? Yeah. Wow. Connecticut? Yep. Wow. But, but okay. not there, 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 there are certain <laughs> counties uh, in, in, throughout the country where if you happen to be in jail and you can't get out because you're too poor to put up the yeah. bail money, yeah. which, is, which is a racial and ethnic exactly. problem to right. begin with, um, typically it's very difficult for you to vote because you, they won't bring in a notary in some places where you need to have your application notarized. Or, they'll, they, or the statute says you can only vote by absentee ballot if you're physically disabled from voting. Well, if you're in jail, are you physically disabled? One might mm. think so, mm. but courts don't right. always uh, construe it that way. And what we're trying to do is to codify the executive, actually make the executive order irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It, for simplicity's sake, if you are incarcerated, ultimately we believe we should have universal suffrage wherever you physically are. Yep. <clears throat> but the state's not there yet. Most people aren't there yet, in all honesty. Um, so it should be simple. If the person is on the street, they should be able to vote without anything else. It's an administrative nightmare. If nothing, if, if aside from its unfairness, as to whether the pardon's been granted, are they on the list, are they not on the list? And too many people are disenfranchised improperly and made to feel like second class citizens, yep. which is the last thing we want. Well, in terms of political strategy, it's easy to understand. Entrenched power doesn't want right. to get, right. give it up. <laughs> One of the ways you don't give it up is to suppress the vote. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all logical. And, and, and the structure of the law and the Stalinist nature, I mean, I think who, who used the term Stalinist to refer to the uh, nomination procedures, Steve Forbes or somebody, that it is intentional. It Definitely. serves interests, and you have to be cognizant of those interests and figure out where you can defeat, in, in some sense, the nexus. Right. And it's easy to think and, of overt suppression. But here in New York, we really have covert suppression right. because all of these difficulties, poorly run elections, badly maintained voter rolls, large numbers of people who are arbitrarily taken off or mysteriously removed from their party affiliation so that they cannot vote the in the primary. Yeah. They, you cannot voluntarily switch your party registration um, within the same year as the primary. But we have several hundred people who got to the polls in September, and they weren't Democrats anymore. 
What, one of the things that I, uh, I'm, I'm still interested in focusing on what we do over the course of the next four and a half weeks and, and you uh, know, dividing that into, into two rough categories. There's everything that happens before November 6th mm -hmm. and then there's November 6th right. uh, in terms of ballot, uh, you know, polling place monitoring and, well, uh, and, and that happens in both directions, November right? 6th. But, but let's, let, let's start first with what happens before November 6th. What do you do that has resonance on that day between now and then? And I'd start with Ezra. Well, I think Susan hit uh, most of the big issues. And you know, she mentioned uh, our election protection program. And the number is 866-OUR-VOTE. And uh, we've been doing it for, uh, it is the largest election protection program in the country. We use thousands of lawyers, thousands of volunteers uh, throughout the country. Um, and uh, we've been doing it every day this year and every election this year. Um, and so if anyone has any difficulties on election day, right. call 866-OUR-VOTE. There's also a Hispanic uh, line. There's also a, several Asian languages and Arabic languages. Mm -hmm. So please, that's one thing is disseminate that, make sure people know about it. In the weeks leading up to the election, it, one of the problems with no longer having Section 5, as Susan mentioned, is that we don't have notice of the somewhat subtle things that occur, or not so subtle, but they're occurring at the local level. Poll consolidations oh. are a big thing, and we may not yep. know about yep. it. Poll if, consolidations meaning? Meaning signs, that right? polling places are being closed down, yep. typically in minority neighborhoods, yep. and move. We had a situation um, two years ago in Macon Bibb County, Georgia, where they closed a, a polling place that was in the <clears throat> African American neighborhood and moved it to the sheriff's office. Not an ideal oh. place for election. <laughs> particularly when the sheriff was running for re-election. Because a local partner was able to tell us about that, in time we were able to help do a petition drive and reverse that. But we don't know, we can't do anything yeah. about it if we don't know about it first. So the, it was really a matter of, unfortunately, getting the word out and making sure people contact people who can help them. So there are very specific things that you do to protect your own vote in addition to knowing what to ask for at the polling place. First of all, um, Check your registration, because magical things happen to our voter rolls. You know you've been uh, voting uh, for the last you know, 20 cycles, uh, 40 years, whatever, you haven't moved. Check online to be sure that your registration is still current, because we have too many people who get to their polling place and are magically not on the rolls. We at Common Cause are doing a lot to try and turn out the vote. Mm -hmm. But you yourself can be your own do-it-yourself, get out the vote with the rule of three. Okay, We have a little mm -hmm. handout. And it's basically there are three things that you do. You pick three friends who you know aren't particularly politically engaged. And you talk to them about why it's personally important to you that people vote, why you think it's important for you to vote and for everybody you know to vote. And you ask them point blank, will you, will you vote on November 6th? And then before the election, you call them, you talk to them, you remind them. Remember, you said you were going to vote. Can we have coffee? Should we go together? What's your plan? Are you going to drop off the kids and then go and vote? Uh, are you going to take the kids with you? It's a great thing to take the kids with you. And you reinforce the idea of voting. And then on election day, you make good on that plan, right? Mm -hmm. You meet them for coffee. You talk about the candidates. You are sure that those additional three people actually get to vote. We're doing aggressive voter turnout directed to occasional young voters with a text banking program. We texted over 200,000 young people, young <coughs> voters Excuse for the me. primary, and our goal is to hit over 500,000 for the general. And we provide text message reminders. If you would like a text message reminder of when our absurd deadlines are, <laughs> October 12th, this coming Friday, is a double whammy. Not only is it the deadline to register to vote in our general election, it is the deadline to assert your party affiliation for next year's primary. And here in New York City, we're going to have some important primaries. Okay, yeah. <laughs> there's going to be a hotly contested primary in Queens for district attorney, mm -hmm. an increasingly important race mm -hmm. across the country. 
And I guarantee we're going to have a primary for public advocate no matter who wins the special election. Nice. I guarantee as much as I can, right? But the, the, the issue of, um, of the, the, the fact that the laws and the way voting is done here, like, again, we, we're made to see, you know, everybody's like, oh, this is an overly democratic state, so really we don't have to worry, and, you know, we don't have as many problems as, like, North Carolina or Texas may have. Uh, that the issues here are much more subvert, you know, covert. It's much more things that are happening. The issue of poll consolidation happens all the time here. And people don't, you know, are really not aware of it or not speaking out against it. There's a lot of shenanigans that go on at the county level, right? The county Democratic parties in each of the counties is, are, do these changes and, and make all these different, without letting people know, things that happen really overtly uh, with very little transparency. There is a lot of stuff that is happening right here. So the idea of one being more vigilant and being more engaged on advocating for changes to happen within our own state, that's a real movement that I think has to take more of a hold because there's a lot of changes that we do need uh, to implement. The issue of making, making sure that we're part of these programs, like having lawyers that want right. to volunteer their day to be at poll sites and help, right? Making sure that people are getting the right information if they have any questions. Not only do we need that in other states, we could also use that here, if not in the city, maybe in other parts of the state. Um, so there's a lot of work, and, and we've seen this election cycle in particular, that yes, we may have a majority Democrats in this city, but not all Democrats are alike, right? And we've seen this wave of change and a movement that is asking for much more left and much more progressive uh, candidates that are true to our democratic values. The anti-IDC movement was very real, right? The issue of having an uh, Alexandria uh, Ocasio defeat uh, a more entrenched de Democrat, you know, it's definitely demonstrating that there are changes within even our own democratic leaning state that have to occur. So we can't take things for granted, and I think that there's a lot more work that we all can be involved in to make sure uh, that we update uh, our voting laws to make it a much more inclusive democracy in Some, the state. Something as basic as the <clears throat> city council had to pass, and to their credit did, a law which requires the New York City Board of Elections to put a oh sign up when they changed the polling place at the old polling place to tell you where the new polling place was. We had to pass a law for something that commonsensical. Doug. Because those changes were being made where? At the county yeah, level, right. behind closed doors, the people didn't know about it, and so then this is a way of, of trying to, to insert right, the legislative branch of the city, the council, to make sure that there was more accountability and transparency. Right. Right. Doug, let, let, let me ask you a question about the politics of all of this. Uh, a, a plurality of Americans believes that there was massive voter fraud in 2016 uh, that skews Republicans, but it goes into Democratic registrants as well. Uh, it's rare that people can get excited or get a group, group excited about a candidacy that's predicated on voting access and these kinds of technical issues. Right. Um, a, why is that true? And B, if we wanted to change what would seem to be widely perceived as a fundamental right and get people excited about protecting it, what would we have to do? Well, I mean, to get in, to answer the first part of your question, you have to do a, a, an in-depth psychology of the American people by group. There is- Richard Hofstadter replied. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, it is absolutely dumbfounding that there is this belief, um, almost universally among Republicans, but you know, with enough Democrats to make your stomach turn, uh, they believe that there is this massive voter fraud. And you know, and everybody else knows, it doesn't happen, but it's a convenient myth. It raises the blood level. It's simple. It can be put on a bumper sticker. So it motivates the base. And that's the whole, whole idea behind that. I mean, there's a whole series of anti-democratic voting uh, movements that are couched in this very visceral bumper sticker like language and you can't rationally counteract it with okay. language that we use right. here. We didn't talk in five sentence bumper stickers. I, so the nuanced conversation sometimes works against us in terms of the the head to head confrontation with the, the the simple-minded. Right, yeah. but we're having a, that kind of discussion. It's not that we don't message on our side. No, no, I am, no, I, no, I, no, I'm not saying that. And I also believe that the uh, capturing the flag approach by not using, uh, you know, professionals 
is a way to go if you could develop networks in localities or states or regions then the, the, the lawyer's job would be made easier because you have a much more extensive population to draw from. And there are a lot of attentive people who would be willing to do that if they knew that it existed. Yeah, and, and, if, and I, they do. If, if I can add to that, there are two good examples. One happened last year and one is happening right now where we can still use the power of litigation to stop some of this stuff. Yeah. The first thing was the ill-conceived Presidential Commission on Election Integrity. Oh, God. Which, uh, because of litigation, not just of my group, but of uh, the ACLU and yeah. any number of other organizations, we were able to stop that in its tracks. And they said when they disbanded that commission that they did so because of the pressure of litigation. Right. Right. That's, that's number one. And that commission was only there to prove the fact that three million voters all voted, <laughs> right. voted fraudulently for Hillary Clinton. That was what the purpose of the, of the commission was. The second thing, and it doesn't sound on its face like a voting rights issue, but boy, is it ever, and it's the single most important voting rights issue today, which is in 2020 census. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, yes. the, and the addition of the citizenship question to that census. We're litigating that case in California. There's litigation in New York by the New York AG and the ACLU. There's litigation in Maryland by MALDEF and, and the, the uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice. All of us are putting yep. pressure to stop that question. Unfortunately, right now, it's going to be going, wending its way up to this new Supreme Court. But we are optimistic that there is absolutely no basis for the decision that the Secretary of Commerce made, that it was arbitrary and capricious, that it was unlawful, yeah. and most important, that it's going to lead to an undercount of minority populations, mm -hmm. particularly Latinos oh, and immigrant yep. populations, that would lead to a decrease in congressional representation in those areas and a decrease in the allocation of $600 billion of federal funding. So it is as important as any issue right now. For I us. Have, for the people on the wrong side of for, the... For, yeah. for, for America. For well, America. That's for America. America. Quickly that's right. on state-level election procedures. Uh, two people would like to know, are there states, any states in the nation that you'd like to point to that are doing particularly yeah. good jobs of mm. this? Yes. Yes. First of all, um, Colorado yeah. has really oh, forward thinking uh, reforms that they've uh, accomplished that. within the last 10 years. Uh, they have uh, every single voter in the state of Colorado receives a ballot by mail. And then you have options as to how to cast that ballot. Yep. You can sit at your kitchen table, fill it out, and mail, mail it back. It. Right. You can sit at your kitchen table, fill it out, and bring it into a early voting center and put it in a special receptacle. Perhaps while smoking illegal sub well, substances. Perhaps. That's what I'm just well, saying. Legal. You know, Colorado it's gives legal. Legal. It's legal in Colorado. I was in Colorado. Colorado. Having a lozenge. Uh, they they solved, we need those here in New York. Just here. saying. In Colorado, they solved the turnout problem. I've had election officials from Colorado say, you want people to vote? Put weed and taxes on your ballot. They'll come. Um, it, or do you, know you, how, do you know how those, if you're saying it's one of the better states, it has is. that impacted the voting Yes, they levels? also have a solid oh, turnout yeah. rate. So they have early voting, they have voting centers, but if you want to cast a traditional ballot on election day, you can come and you can get a ballot on the spot on election day. So they allow voters mm -hmm. the dignity and respect of making up their own minds of how best to vote, mm -hmm. right? We're adults, we're choosing our representatives. We ought to be able to figure out what's most convenient and works best for us in our busy lives as to when to vote. California has a lot of voting reforms and the County of Los Angeles is doing something that I advocate for and love. They are writing their own election software. So if they're using open source software and they are going to be able to own all of the code and they're going to be able to program their own machine so they're not dependent on commercial vendors who take off the rack Microsoft yep. programs and fidget with them, leave all kinds of back doors that allow them to be hacked and then claim they're proprietary yep. and when things go wrong, you can never figure it out. So there, and California has early voting, it has uh, permanent absentee, 40, 
it's close to 60%, I believe now. In California, yeah. they're voting by mail, not through a vote by mail system, but because they're permanent absentees. And the campaigns have two big deadlines that they work on where they message up to a crescendo before the absentee ballots go out because they know when they're going out. And they message up to a crescendo when, before, when? during the early voting period. And they have much more reliable online voter registration and automatic voter registration. So California, Oregon, it's entirely vote by mail. Yeah. Some people like that, some people don't. Up until uh, 2014, North Carolina had a much better system than we did, frankly. They had all of the reforms that we're fighting for that we haven't been able to pass, and that's why they're trying to roll them back. Two more questions, and then we are done for the day. Uh, lots of folks want to know how we goose participation among different uh, elements of the population. Uh, one of the questioners wants to know how we can get young people who do not vote at the same uh, rates of participation, for example, as people my age. Uh, how we can get uh, greater levels of turnout in minority communities. How we can get people who are shut in, able, unable to leave their homes, uh, adequately <laughs> represented. Thoughts around the table, and Melissa, let me start with you since this well, is I mean, very I much think, your stock and trade. Look, the, the bottom, you know, representation does matter. Right? People want to see themselves reflected in the government that represents them. You know, when I became Speaker of the City Council, I saw the response that I was getting from the Latino yep. community that was like, you know, seeing themselves mm -hmm. represented at a citywide level and the, the significance and the impact because they felt their voice was being heard, you know, and that's somebody that understood their issues. So as Latino Victory endorsing so only Latino candidates, we do see that when Latinos are on the ballot, particularly in areas that have large Latino populations, we do see a surge and we do see mm -hmm. an interest, right, in people being, because they're feeling that government is being responsive to their needs. And that's ultimately what government needs to be, is to be responsive to the reality of the changes that are occurring around us. So uh, we've seen that, and, and just looking at this election cycle, there has been, right, polling is up in arms. The polling companies are up in arms, and many of them, in some cases, and I, you know, local and home, the Crowley versus Alexandria race, right? The polls were all off. The polls were <laughs> off in the upstate race when we had a congressional race of a Latina running against, I'm forgetting the, the, the one who's the candidate now, where some of these polls were saying that uh, the, the incumbent or the preferred candidate was 20, 30 points ahead, and it was the insurgent candidate that came out from behind. So. There's, uh, when people feel that someone is speaking to them and they want you know, authenticity, they don't want a politician that's just gonna give them the talk that they expect, you know, that you are seeing incredibly a change in the, in the dynamics on the ground. I mean, to me, I've been fascinated by a lot of the candidates we've endorsed, um, but the Beto O'Rourke campaign yep. in Texas is incredibly fascinating to watch in terms of how he is connecting and across parties. Because there is a you know a, a sec sector a section of the Republican Party that is going to vote for him, you know, and so he's appealing uh, as a candidate to both sides because of the way he speaks about the issues and connects with uh, the average Texan, right? So, uh, I mean, it's it's really an interesting so, time. It's like so different than right. what we've. So you're you're really to. putting the emphasis on candidates rather yes. than on yeah. turnout yeah. Me yeah. mechanics. Yeah. Well, I Any think they thoughts? go together. Yes, they, yeah, they, they go together. The candidates help with the turnout, but you have to have the turnout. Yep. Um, operations because humans need reminders. We just do. We have busy lives, and and you know there is only a certain segment of the population who cares passionately about politics. You know that from your own circle. Of <coughs> you're probably the person who gets the others. They are the ones that family and friends call to say, "Who the hell is on the ballot, and who or who should I vote for?" Right? Well, the research shows there's always in any grouping there's one person. You say, well, you don't pay attention to politics. How do you decide who to vote for? Well, my sister or my brother-in-law or my father-in-law, they, they go to all the meetings, they know all the candidates. I call them and they tell me who to vote for. So if you're that person, again, it's the rule of three. <laughs> it's using your own capability and find a turnout program, whether it's for a candidate, whether it's canvassing, which means walking the neighborhoods, phone banking, or now we're using text messaging. And on the campuses, we're seeing more programs. There's a great group that's been formed here in New York City called Motivote. It's peer-to-peer -peer use of social messaging to have young people talk to young people to turn out the vote. I'm predicting another two cycles max 
that text messaging is going to be as potent as it is now for increasing turnout, but when we're all, when we're all starting to use it, it's going to get old. So I'm hoping it survives through the 2020 presidential election because right now it's really moving people. So there are programs that all of us are running, nonpartisan programs or partisan programs. Take your, take your pick. They actually work. People need a human touch, whether through a machine or person to person, to go get out and vote, and that's how we'll increase turnout. Better candidates and real turnout efforts. I, I want to thank our panelists, but before asking, please, if you could, you could do that now, I'm going to ask you to do it again.